Well, good morning, church. I'm so glad to see you here this morning. And for those of you who are at home, don't worry, we can't see you. Uh, everything's okay. If you watch church in pajamas, that's just fine. We don't mind at all. Just know that uh, this morning we are blessed to be present here with those who can attend in, in person. And we're thankful for everyone who can and understand a lot who cannot yet. But the numbers are looking much better, aren't they? It is so nice to see better hospital numbers and all that kind of stuff is just much better than it was. So uh, we are indeed blessed. Let's not forget to thank God for those changes. And, you know, what I want to draw your attention to is that we are at the point that we're very close to adding back a Wednesday night function. Um, so what that will be coming in the next couple of weeks, I want you to just keep in tune with your uh, email. I'll be sending out an announcement that way. Some of you who came in this morning may have noticed the, uh, the uh, building smelled a little differently. It actually should have smelled a little bit more like a post-rain shower, if you remember what that smells like. Uh, that's ozone after it breaks down into pure oxygen. It smells like just after a, after a lightning storm. So we practiced using that system. It does help to keep the air cleaner than it would be otherwise from a health standpoint, but it is not a perfect cure, so it does not mean that we drop our masks or drop our guard. We still keep our seating the same, and uh, we still keep our masks on at all times. And you can sing. Just make sure you have your mask on as you sing, and you'll be just fine. So uh, we are indeed blessed. So keep, your, keep an eye on your email, and I'll send you those notices. Uh, all the other information, the announcements, all in the newsletter, so I encourage you to read that every week. And as we come to worship this morning with King of Love, I want you to open your hearts and be ready to receive the Holy Spirit. He's got a word for you today. Before we bring them up to uh, get the music started, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, sometimes I get so excited I forget to pray out loud. We had our blessing this morning and our prayer before we came into service, and it's always an encouraging time for me. Help each one of us to find that kind of time each day, to slow down and listen to you, to ask that you speak through us, that you always give us the direction we need, and not that you give it as much that we realize it and follow that direction. Today, Lord, you've granted us this day to be present with these people, both in person and online, and we pray a blessing on each. And whether they're financially supporting this ministry or others through tithes and offerings, mailed in or dropped in the box, whatever they are, Lord, we dedicate those gifts to you, to the furtherance of your kingdom. Help us, Lord, to realize that we should not be living for ourselves, but living for you in the kingdom at all times. So, Lord, we ask this blessing on us today that we're come to worship you in a way that is honoring to you and beneficial to the kingdom, one that lifts us up, but more than anything, Lord, we want to exalt you as our King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen.
the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way that man is a thief and a robber but he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep to him the gatekeeper opens the sheep hear his voice and he calls his, his own sheep by name and leads them out when he has brought out all his own he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice a stranger they will not follow but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the word of the Lord, and we can trust it. Thanks be to God. You know, all these examples that are like right out of agriculture, I just love it. So we talk about, you know, shepherds and sheep and I think it's so interesting how our culture changes. At one time, we may think that a, a particular industry is good or positive, and then suddenly somebody figures out how to turn it into a negative. You know, it was a time that, that I would have thought of a sheep as being an animal that was just cute and cuddly and, and just an adorable little animal, and then suddenly I find out that means you have no mind and you follow blindly. It's like, well, no, actually it doesn't. It, and God's example is, is timeless. And what he's trying to teach us in this particular passage, which we've talked about before, is that there are people to lead us who are good people, and then there are people who will try to lead us who are not good, and they don't have our, our good intentions, or don't have good intentions for us. So I've been talking a lot about depression, and today I want you to know that you know, hope and depression are profoundly linked. They are connected. So I don't want you to just think that you can either be filled with hope or you can be filled with depression because the truth is we are always in a balance of the two. 
We're being tugged in both directions at all times, depending on our circumstances and the way we choose to deal with those circumstances. And then there's the magic dust of how capable we are to deal with whatever the circumstances are. But if we feel depressed for long enough, we will actually lack hope. And if you start to be a little hopeless, you will eventually become truly depressed. So that's when I say that they're connected. It really is. Now, regardless of whether this is an organic issue, meaning you have a chemical imbalance in your brain or, or whatever, or it's just because of some other issue, for all of us, the connection between hope and feeling is important for us to understand. Because the little words we say to ourselves, the little things that we allow ourselves to hear, impacts the way we feel. And if you don't think that's true, just listen to somebody, let's say a, a teenage girl who believes that she's just grossly overweight. And you look at her and you think, my gosh, you know, you may maybe you weigh 85 pounds. You are not grossly overweight. But if she tells herself enough that she's grossly overweight, she will come to believe that. Now, there's a medical disorder that can cause that as well. But in society overall, what we end up with is a lot of people thinking untrue things about themselves. And when we come to decide things like we're talking about things like weight or, or appearance or whatever, whose impression matters? Does it matter if, if Joe down the street thinks that you've got an extra 10 pounds on? No. Does it matter if, you're, uh, if your friends think that you've, you've lost too much weight? No. Does it matter if, if your spouse thinks that, that you look better with, with brown hair instead of white hair? Yes. I saw some people shaking their heads left to right. I'm, I'm just telling you, I do marital counseling. I can help you with that. <laughs> Scripture's really clear about that. When you get married, you become the, your body becomes, get, gets given over to actually your spouse. So I can't do anything with my body without my wife's permission. If she want, thinks I need to lose weight, I need to lose weight. It's not a question. If she thinks I need to gain weight, I need to gain weight. It's not a question. If she thinks I need to dye my hair... I'm going to ask her to collect it up off the floor and bring it to me. You know, and I'll dye all the floor, all the floor hair she wants. But see, we've talked about a lot of these reasons for depression, and part of it is our perception, the way we see ourselves, which is not necessarily true and not, certainly not the way other people see us. See, we tend to look at ourselves sometimes through a historical perspective and we'll think, well, you know, I used to. I used to weigh less. How often has somebody told you, well, I weighed, I weighed 20 pounds less when I was in high school, or I weighed, you know, well, you're not in high school anymore. Get over it. Well, I was really gorgeous when I was in, in grade school. Well, you're not in grade school, but you're still gorgeous to God. So get over the past and deal with where you are today, and what matters to God is what's on the very inside of our heart. And we do not do a good enough job as individuals identifying where somebody else's heart is. And you know why we don't identify where their heart is very well? Because we don't identify where our heart is very well. We tend to just throw things out there. They speak from the hip, you know, and people are kind of proud about that sometimes. Oh, I just tell, let you know what I'm thinking. I said, well, no, what you're telling me is you didn't really think before you said. <laughs> it's not that you're letting me know what you're thinking. You need to, need to rein in those thoughts because if you actually think those things, then you're going to program yourself to believe those things. If you believe that your spouse couldn't boil water on top of a fire, well, then you know what? Nothing they make is going to taste good. You're going to convince yourself of whatever you keep repeating. So we need to, we need to get our, our handle, a handle on this. Now, our ability to manage the stress around us, some of it is, is genetic, some of it is, is the way we're raised, and some of it is flat-out obstinance. But we are still responsible. It doesn't matter how much of it is a genetic and how much of it is our environment from being raised. It doesn't make any difference. God doesn't have a different set of rules for you depending on how you were raised as a child and whether you were cuddled as a child or whether you were spanked as a child or any of those. He holds us personally responsible. So our first takeaway for each one of us to, to get our mind around is that we have got to guard our heart. You've got to protect what you're putting in your heart. You've got to make sure you're watching the right things on TV or listening. When you listen to news, don't obsess over the news. And let me just tell you, if you're watching one news channel, just one, you are in trouble. 
You're programming yourself to be lied to because that one news channel is a perspective that's probably not true. Well, it isn't true. It's at least slanted. Open your minds to that. If you want a single source for one thing to to study, to learn about what's going on in the world, it's actually the scripture written many, many years ago. But it helps you to look at what current events are in a perspective that is godly instead of looking at the news as if the news is godly. Now, I often say that we're, that we're supposed to care about the heart because God cares about the heart, and that is true. And we should care about the heart of others. We've got to figure that out, but we've got to care about our own heart too and watch what we're feeding ourselves. Proverbs fourteen thirteen says this, A glad heart makes a cheerful face, but by sorrow of heart the spirit is crushed. Have you ever known someone to have a crushed spirit? Have you ever seen someone who just, you see it in children more than, more than adults, or you don't identify it as easily with adults, but they just are broken. It wouldn't matter what happened in front of them, they wouldn't be able to rejoice because all joy, all hope has been taken from them, usually by an abusive adult. But what we've got to do for ourselves is we've got to protect our hearts, which means sift through our thoughts. Don't just accept your thought and say, well, it's my thought, so I've got to live with it. But actually ask yourself, why is it I think what I think? Why is it I feel down today? Why is it I'm so excited today? Why is it I'm having a hard time rejoicing today? If you don't talk to yourself about your feelings, and if you don't analyze where your feelings are coming from, and I'll give you a hint, all your feelings come from two, or your thoughts come from two places. They either come from God or they come from Satan. That's it. Those are the only two sources. So the question is, is this thought I'm having, is this feeling I'm I'm experiencing, is it coming from God or is it coming from Satan? So as I look around, I see so many people that are crushed in spirit, especially today through this pandemic time. That finally, we're seeing the reporting, accurate, more accurate reporting, I think, of, of the crisis that's being created by people being out of work and, and living with the stress of illness and people they know who are sick. And finally, more people, I say finally, it was going to happen, but you know, more people are knowing somebody who got really sick and probably somebody who's, who's passed away from this pandemic. And because of all that, the pressure is starting to build, and you're seeing people reach out for for mental health services more, and you're seeing more people identify that they've even thought of suicide. In fact, there was one report that came out just this last week that the number of people who are reporting that they've thought about suicide in the last month has gone up by 25% over this time last year. And I don't doubt that number at all. In fact, I think, if anything, that number is low. Now, if I told you that there was a gunman about to attack the church and he's walking in the door right now, would you do something? You wouldn't just sit there and wait for something to happen, right? You would do something. Well, now, what if I were to tell you that there's a gunman who's going to come to the church? I know he's coming to the church. He's just left I-35. He's on 725, headed this way. He's about three and a half miles away. He's driving a blue Impala. He's got a a balaclava on, you know, full face mask on. He's got a a battle helmet on, and he's got two guns on either side. He's got handguns on on his hip, and he's got some type of assault rifle in his arms. And he's going to be coming up here. He should be here in about four minutes. Would you do something? (laughs) <laughs> yeah. What's the difference between the two? Well, when you know someone is coming and you know what they look like and you know what to look out for, then you stand a much better chance of, of protecting yourself and doing something about that attack, right? I promise you, if in that second scenario, there's no one who's going to get through that driveway. Certainly not in a blue Impala. We'll never let them get close to this building. And what I'm presenting to you is that we need to be doing the same thing with Satan. We can't just say, well, there's this guy named Satan and he's out there and he's going to come in and try to mess with your life. That's not good enough. We need to know what he looks like, what he sounds like. We need to know it way ahead of time so we can do something about his presence because we know he's coming. We know it. So that's really what the message all is, is all about today. Which gives us our second takeaway, and that is that Satan is the enemy of your heart. And if you don't realize Satan is the enemy of your heart, you're in trouble. Satan will come at you through the internet, through, through uh, 
through a workplace. He'll come at you through a, a scantily clad somebody somewhere. He's going to come at you through some kind of an offer on TV. He's going to come through to you through an offer in the mail. He's going to come to you through the phone where he says, you know, I'm calling from the Social Security Department and, and someone has hijacked your information. I need you to confirm your Social Security number so we can get this taken care of. That's Satan. You will be taken for everything if you get into that. Why is it most people in this church would not fall victim to that, to that scenario? Because we've talked about it. You've been informed. You've listened to the news. You know not to do it. Same thing with Satan as he works in other parts of our life. So how is Satan affecting you? Because he's going to come at you differently than he comes away from me. But we live in this culture that, that says that there is no black and white. There is no right or wrong. That everything is relative. What's right for me is right for me, but that doesn't mean that it's right for you. But you know, the Bible doesn't say that, right? There is right and there is wrong. There is up, there is down, there is light, there is darkness. We need to understand that. And Satan will always attack that and try to get you to, to think, well, it's okay for them to think that way. It's okay if, if, if they believe that, that, that living together outside of marriage is okay, they, and they believe that's okay with God, then that's their business to think about that. Well, I can't impose my, my beliefs on them, but I do have to let them know that God says otherwise. And His rules don't change because of our culture. He's trying to change our culture because of His rules. So we need to get that very straight in our mind. You know, when somebody feels hurt, and that happens all the time, right? We may not be able to see or understand what's causing that feeling of hurt. We may never understand it, especially if it's somebody who's close to us. But we need to, under, they, we need to realize that we serve the Lord who does see and understand what is causing their hurt. And instead of us somehow thinking we can fix their hurt, we can't. Instead, what we need to do is realize that our job is to introduce them to the one who can fix their hurt. We need to introduce them to God. We need to, to not just say, he's over there. We need to drag him over and show him and put him in, in direct contact. But when we, we focus on things incorrectly, when we, when we re don't think of ourselves as children of God, worthy of God sending his son to die for us, when we don't focus on that, and instead we focus on our earthly imperfections, you know, the fact that I'm not rich, the fact that I'm losing hair, the fact that I'm not making a lot of money, the fact that I, I messed up yesterday, I lost my temper in traffic, the fact that I was, you know, you go on and on and on. And even if those things are all true, if I'm focused on those earthly imperfections, Instead of looking at my life the way God looks at me in my life, I will forever be drawn to depression. Because I'm drawn to something, I would be trying to do something that's not possible. I can never be good enough. So we have to accept that you will never be good enough. Wouldn't it be awesome if, if parents would teach your kids that in a loving way instead of saying, you're never going to be any good? Say, honey, you are beautiful and you are smart and you are never to be judged by the person next to you. God looks at you and says, oh, my child. So I look at you and say, oh, my child. I love you and always will. That's how we raise children who love God and honor him. As opposed to telling them that it's, life is a true competition, that you have to stand on top of someone else in order to benefit. You see, if, if we don't acknowledge that God did all these things because he loves us, he wanted relationship with us, then that puts us in a position that we can barely interact with the people around us or the circumstances that are negative around us. But knowing that God doesn't focus on our earthly imperfections, He narrow fo narrowly focuses on our heart. And says, where is their heart? Are they trying to serve me? Are they trying to love people in my name? When He, when he stares at us that way, it's a beautiful thing. But then we have the other side of the coin, us focusing on earthly perfections and, and God looking at us differently, and then we have this little whisper in our, in our ear. Don't we have two whispers? We have two ears, we have two whispers. We've got God telling us, I love you and you're beautiful and you're my child. And on the other side, we have Satan. And Satan is telling us that we're not good enough, we'll never be good enough, we might as well have fun. It's not what you, it's, it's not what you want because you don't feel like it. 
And you know what Satan really is? He's really the greatest mathematician ever. The greatest mathematician. Now, why would Adam say that, that the, Satan is the greatest mathematician ever? Because he is the master of division. He absolutely tries to divide everything God has built. Everything God wants to put together, Satan will try to tear apart. Whether it's the family, whether it's church, whether it's community, he will always try to divide. So when you're trying to identify, is this from Satan or is this from God, ask yourself, are we being brought together or are we being divided? Remember I said earlier about watching how much news you watch. Do you think watching news in your family, especially if you have different mindsets in your family, do you think watching news, a lot of news, divides you or does it bring you together? It's a multiple choice question. There are two options, divides or bring you together. It divides you, right? It will not bring you together unless you have the right lens with which to see the news. And you cannot possibly have the right lens if you have a single source. It doesn't give you perspective. Do you know why somebody who can only see in one eye, do you know why they can't drive very well? Well, it could be two reasons. One, their spouse poked them in the eye because of their driving. But it could also be because when you don't have two eyes, you have monovision. It's not your brain putting together your, the, the left and the right eye. It's out of a single eye. And the way you judge speed is your brain takes the position of an, one item that's fixed and then the item that's moving out of the different eye, and it, it does some high-end high calculus to say, okay, they're moving fast, they're moving slow. Guess how you do depth perception very much the same way. When you look down and you see there's a step there, your eyes are kind of going back and forth, focusing on one, then focusing on the other, and saying, okay, the distance between them is, and that's how you know what's coming. So it takes two eyes to do that well. Now, people can adapt and see okay out of one eye, and they can drive okay, but not as great when they have one eye. But you need multiple sources of information if you want to have a good perspective on what's going on around you. So do we get that? When I put a sermon together, I don't read a single commentary. I read the Bible and I read several commentaries to get different people's perspective on what they saw out of that particular passage, what the history of the, those passages are, because it's important that we have a good perspective instead of just following a narrow line. The narrow line part, the laser part, is the Bible. But then when you're looking for understanding, you sometimes need to see how others understand it. And the more you listen to, the better chance you have. It doesn't mean you'll agree with all of them, and I certainly don't. Have you ever heard the phrase, what God has put together, let no man set asunder? Remember, they used to refer to that in wedding ceremonies. It's not done very much anymore because they know divorce happens all the time. But God brings us together and Satan tries to break us apart. That's really what this is all about. But takeaway three tells you, Satan lies. He's a liar. He is absolutely a liar. And since Satan is a liar, we know that we should quit listening to him. You know, once, once you've gone to the store and they've sold you a bill of goods and not delivered on what you thought you were buying, do you go back to the same store and ask for it again? No. No. If they lie to you once, you figure they're going to lie to you again. Yet time and time again, we let Satan lie to us, and then we say, well, I was thinking this time would be different. This time I thought I could have just one drink. This time I thought it would be okay if I, I worked late with my secretary and we were the only two there. I thought I, was, I thought I was over that. I thought today wasn't like yesterday. Or put it in a different way, I thought I didn't need to learn a lesson. John eight forty four defines who Satan is. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of liars, or father of lies. We know that. Let that information that we know form how we listen and how we act in our daily life. Don't pretend like it's something that it's not. So God gives us this, this tremendous promise in Isaiah 43. But now, the, now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And 
when you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. When you think you are being overwhelmed, you feel like you're overwhelmed, you just can't possibly go on, you can't handle any more pain, you can't whatever, how is it that Isaiah 43 is not supposed to apply to you? Is there something in your Bible that says, everybody except for you, this is true? No. This is the promise of God that he will... But you notice he doesn't say he's going to remove it. Just the fact that you look at Isaiah 43 doesn't mean that, that suddenly you're going, to, um, you're going to not have cancer if you were diagnosed with cancer. It doesn't mean that. And it doesn't mean that you're going to survive the brain tumor. Not here. But what it does promise is when God takes you home, you will be healed. That there's a kind of healing that doesn't occur on earth. And it's eternal. And you can go to your eternal resting place, as we call it. We can go to heaven with a full knowledge that we will be healed because the teller of truth promised us that that's what would happen. I hope you see in this Isaiah 43, 1 through 3, that there are actually three parts. In the beginning, there was a reminder that God created us, which is kind of cool to remind yourself all the time. Second was the statement that to fear or not. Don't you hate it when you're afraid and somebody says, don't be afraid. It's like, if I wasn't afraid, then I wouldn't have to be told not to be afraid. And then, of course, a third part is, and the reason for that is that fear is always going to break us apart. It's going to separate us. The third part is that we're reminded that God will walk with us through every trial. Not that you will poof be brought out of the trial, but he will walk with you through it, which means you're not alone, so quit thinking you're alone. God promises you're not alone. You may feel alone, but there's a difference between what we feel and what is true. Since we're looking at how we know the enemy of hope, let me just simplify it. Satan's desires are the exact opposite of God's desires. So God wants to bring us together. Satan wants to separate us. God wants us to love each other and love others as ourselves. Satan wants us to put ourselves first. God wants us to, uh, to know that we're never alone. And Satan, of course, wants us to think that we are alone and we are not going to be able to make it through our struggles. Now, last year, <clears throat> I got frustrated with some of our pro sports teams. I used to talk a lot about one of our local teams and how proud I was of them. And I just got frustrated, and I finally got to the point. I said, you know, I, I watch sports as an escape. I don't watch sports because I want to hear politics. That's just not, I don't want to do that. Now, I'm not a big, I don't, I don't call for boycotts and all that kind of stuff, but I'm personally just not going to participate in that anymore. So I kind of did, and I made this one, this one statement. I said, look, I couldn't care less. You know, I just couldn't care less. I'm not going to watch the games anymore. <clears> or <throat> not very much, and, you know, I'll just kind of follow the, sc the scores on, on the news. I have to deal with that. Well, I was wrong last year because things got so much worse in the last year that I realized last year I could have cared less because this year I care less than I did last year. So be careful when you say that. I couldn't care less. No, it's entirely possible that you can care less, and I did. So now I don't even follow the score uh, scores on the news. In fact, when that part of the news comes on, I turn it off. Now, you could say, well, you need to get over it and all that. And I say, well, that's okay. But see, I watch for relaxation. I'm not getting relaxed by watching and it. it doesn't benefit me. It doesn't get me closer to God. It doesn't help me spread the gospel. So tell me again why I need to get over it. I don't have to get over it. I'm not holding a personal grudge, but I'm not going to watch it anymore until things change anyway. But you see, Satan will always be working overtime to attack the hope that we have, regardless of where your hope is. You see, I saw a local sports team as, as a sign, as a beacon of, of good character in sports and good people doing good things and, and, a, and a good team as well. So kind of all-rounded, all around. And guess what happened as always when you, when you depend too much on people, the human factor, is you realize they're not God. They're going to let you down sometime. But the tactic used to destroy our hope comes down to three basic steps. These are Satan, this is Satan's plan. First, he's going to kill our joy. Then he's going to steal our peace, and then he will destroy your identity. How can he destroy your identity? If you believe that you are not worthy, he has destroyed your identity. How could that be? Simple. God sent Jesus to die on the cross for you. Because he died on the cross for you, you are his child. That is your identity. He is your father. You are his child. 
When you say, I'm not good enough for Jesus to have died on the cross for me, what you're doing is rejecting God and rejecting who you are to God. That's what Satan wants. That's the ultimate prize for Satan. If he can get us to be totally divided, if he can get us to, 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 to uh, not have peace in our heart, if he can get us to not identify as a Christian, identify as a child of God, then he indeed wins. Now, a good coach would tell you if you're in a battle of some sort, you're in some big game, he'd say, well, you need to know two things. You need to know your abilities, and you need to know your opponent's abilities. Don't worry about what you can't do. Worry about what you can do, Right? But you need to know your abilities, you need to know their abilities. So what do they bring into the game? If it's football, you might think about, you know, do they do a passing game or a running game? Do they have you know, certain players at certain places that do certain things? You need to know all that. Well, we have got to know the same kind of thing about Satan. So when somebody tells you that they feel down or they feel hopeless... Guess what, that's a, uh, what that really means is that this situation is hopeless. They are not hopeless, right? I mean, they, and it may be that the situation is hopeless. You may have to declare bankruptcy. Okay, so that situation is actually hopeless in that case fine from a financial perspective. But you are not hopeless. But we as Christians have to be able to turn that around for people and say, you know, the situation may be hopeless, but you are not hopeless. God still loves you even if you did lose all your money. God still loves you even if you do lose your medical battle. Whatever it is, He still loves you. So you're not hopeless. Because you can't have joy and you can't have peace if you are hopeless. These things are all connected one to the other. But when someone says, I am hopeless, I am hurt, I am not worthy, not only have they told themselves out loud, they've told themselves in their heart that, and they've heard themselves say that. That's why it's so powerful. In counseling, they tell you to do things like st use statements of affirmation. I am pretty, I am smart, I am strong, I am able, I will not do bad things, I will do good things. Those statements of affirmation are the I am's and I, I will's, and then, of course, you've got Satan telling you all the things about how you can't possibly do that. You're not strong enough. We're not strong enough alone, but God can help you with that. But what we've got to do is understand that there is a difference between what we feel and what we are. It's okay to feel one thing when you're something different. In fact, that's really true for all of us, whether we know it or not. So it gives us our fourth takeaway, and that is that we're supposed to focus on truth over feelings. Now, when you want to connect with somebody, you want to find out how they feel, you'll ask them, say, how do, you, how do you feel about that? But if you let people go down a real long road about feelings without ever addre addressing the truth of it, you can help people get buried in, 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 in misinformation or, or lies. So when somebody t if somebody were to sit down with me and say, you know, I say, well, how are you feeling today? Oh, I feel ugly. I feel fat. I feel mean. I feel inadequate. It's like, well, I'm not going to let them get to number five. I've got to speak some truth in there at some point. Now, I'll, yes, I will let them get there eventually, but I'm going to slow them down and say, well, gosh, you know, when I look at you, I see a, a beautiful smile and I see a lot of energy and I see kindness and warmth. And so I just see you a little differently. I just help, help me understand why you're saying you feel that way about yourself. And even in our family settings, you know, when somebody's upset, ask them about why they feel upset. Don't just let them say they're upset. And then get them the help they need, this professional level for the deep-rooted stuff that they need. But you always still have to be that person who brings them the light of Christ in that situation. So you've got to be able to listen to somebody who's, you might say, whining, complaining, whatever, and give them proper perspective and then connect them to the right source for real counseling. Because you're not the counselor. But we know who the ultimate counselor is. His name is Jesus. John 10.10, 10, we heard earlier, the thief, that's Satan, comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Now, clearly, God wants great things for us, and we know all things are possible through God. That's a good thing. But how do we defeat this enemy who wants to steal and destroy from us? How do we regain hope when we feel like we're hopeless? Well, I'll tell you, there's power in truth. So since we know God is truth and God loves us and He wants us to have this, this abundant life, then the best way to get out of a funk is to go to the truth, the truth of God's Word and the truth of perspective from those who know God's Word. 
So we've got to know the truth. And what is that? How, do, how many times has the pastor said, read your Bible? Well, read your Bible. It is the truth. It's the only place you're going to find the absolute timeless truth is in the Bible. Now, if you're thinking you don't know enough about the Bible and you, you, know, so you need somebody to teach it to you, okay, we call that Bible study. And I know, I know, I know there's this thing called a pandemic and it's COVID and all this and we can't come to Bible study on Sunday mornings right now and we can't do Bible study on Wednesday. Oh, we can do Bible study on Wednesday. Huh. You have to Zoom. You have to press the, the link on your email that says press here, click here. You have to do that. And then through your computer or through your phone, you can actually be a part of the Bible study. And I know if that's just uncomfortable, you say, well, I, 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 just, I just can't do that. It's just too much. I think, oh, okay. So do you ever watch a movie on your TV? Anybody ever live stream a movie or rent a movie from Netflix or, or watch a funny YouTube video? A funny YouTube video, huh? If you can watch a funny YouTube video, you can watch a church service. It's the same finger that goes, tick. <laughs> ha! Cool finger! Now you might have to use a mouse instead. But you have the ability, it's just different than it used to be, so you're out of your comfort zone, and I get that. But you know what? God says He never wants us to stay in our comfort zone. He doesn't want us to be comfortable. I just, I just can't imagine on Judgment Day, you know, you stand before God and say, well, why is it you got so separated from your, your church family and, and, and you know, you, 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 you quit studying the Word? Why is that? I say, well, God, there, were, there was this virus that was affecting everybody and they made them stay home and, and, and everybody had to stay home and, and watch things on TV and, 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 and listen on the computer. That's all they could do. They couldn't, get, they couldn't gather. They couldn't gather in physical sense. So I didn't gather in physical sense. I didn't study the Bible. Internet, you ever heard of it? Oh, yeah. That's what you went home to watch all the time? All those hours? I mean, the Internet use has gone through the roof during this pandemic. One of the ways you can use the Internet for positive is not to chase every news story that gets you upset, but instead trade that out for clicking on something that will bring you peace. Click on, on, on preaching. Click on uh, music that, that is glorifying to God. Spend some time with Him in a different way. You know, I view, uh, when you're married for a long time, and I know many of you have been married for a long time, sometimes with the same spouse, sometimes not. But, you know, at its, you get to a point sometimes and it's just nice to go away, right? To go on a trip, take a vacation together. And you really usually enjoy your spouse a lot on those vacations. Why is it that you can enjoy yourself so much when you're away from home? Because your perspective has changed. You have to approach things a little differently, right? How about if you just do that while you're at home? Think of it as a staycation for the, with the Word of God. Think of it as time to, to spend finding new ways you can explore your relationship with God. Now, all that being said, I'm, I'll just tell you that we're looking very soon to be able to, to do a midweek service that, where people can be present, and those who need to watch at home will be able to watch it probably the next day, which is a great thing for those who, who don't feel like they, they want to be, be a part of a live something or another, which is going to open up pretty soon. Watch your email for that. <clears throat> but it won't change things if your heart isn't right. Because when we come back together, it's still going to have some restrictions on seating and, and what you can do and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, if that's what you're after, <clears throat> the way it used to be, it will never be the way it used to be because today is today. Yesterday is gone, and we have a new reality to deal with. But do you know that should not separate us from God? That should bring us closer to God. Find a new way to worship and learn about your Lord and Savior. Find a new way to engage with your friends. You know, maybe, it's, you, maybe you've got a friend who is not quite as technologically adept as you are and, and they're having trouble getting online. Well, then let us know and we'll help them out. Get on the phone with them while they're watching it and talk to them about a service or, or the Bible study. Talk to them about what's, <clears throat> what you learned from it and what you had trouble with. But there are more ways to study and stay connected with the Bible now than what we had through Grace Church a year ago. And that's a good thing. So there is some good that came out of this. Let's make sure we don't, that we don't let that lesson go away. So what can we do aside from that? Well, Scripture gives us great, great advice, of course, and that is that we need to speak truth in all circumstances. In Psalm 146.1, it says to praise the Lord, 
For it is good to sing praises to our God. For it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. He determines their number of their stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our God and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. Getting better psychologically, emotionally, starts with us being better at being obedient to God. And you can't be obedient to a God you don't know. So study God's word. Praise God. Find out a way to praise God. You know, we could, pray, we could say that, that, that how terrible it is that, that it's 100 and, it was 107 yesterday or whatever it was, 105, 107. Say how terrible that is. I was complaining about that being so terrible that it's so hot while I was sitting inside my air-conditioned house with a fan blowing. How about I turn that around and say, praise God for air conditioning? Why is it so much easier to complain about the things that make us uncomfortable instead of praising God for the comforts He gives us? Because in that example, you know that's true, right? Yeah, it's hot outside. We'll stay inside and pray for those people who don't have air conditioning and don't have the ability to be inside because they're homeless. But we can still praise God. You see, if we want abundant life, what we've got to do is be humble as we seek Him. We've got to be that guy who who is seeking him in all circumstances. We've got to be that guy who refuses to let Satan Satan take the joy or hope from them by always trusting the good shepherd. The good shepherd will not let you down because he's going to lead us. He's going to help us find our way. He's going to be our strength because we don't have enough strength ourselves, And we don't need that strength from us. Let's count on the Lord. And draw nearer to him as brothers and sisters in Christ. As we learn to identify the methods of Satan. So we can steer clear and protect ourselves. That we might be able to hear one day, well done my good and faithful servant. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you from the bottom of our heart for being our Lord, our Savior. We thank you for this image of being a good shepherd. One who... If we know your voice, we know when to do what we need to do. So we know when Satan is talking to us that it's Satan and not you because we've studied your voice and we know your character. We know what is right and what is wrong. So Lord Jesus, we just look to you and ask that you to, to hear our praises as we lift you up for all the blessings you've given us, every, every bit of air conditioning, every bit of food we have, all the, the health care advantages that we have. We thank you and praise you for that, Lord. And as we praise you for that, Lord, we are very well aware of those who don't have as much, those who are struggling even more, those who are, are missing you, those who don't even know to miss you, Lord, those who are without hope today, we lift them up and ask that you help to work through us that we might bring them the light of Christ, that they might have eternal hope. These things we ask in your blessed name, Lord Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Thank you.
Just a reminder, I will be sending out an email about the midweek class, if you will. Just know that uh, how appreciative I really am of those who have been doing those things online. So we've been able to record the midweek and put it online for anybody who, who wants to watch it afterwards. That part is going to stay in place. So even though if you're not able to get online or, or, or come in person for medical reasons or whatever on, on Wednesday night, you'll be able to pick up that same Bible study is going to be broadcast the next day. So you will be able to still get the content. But there should never be a time that we can't get close to God. God is always with us, and He will give us many ways that we can get close to Him if we choose to. But let's just make every effort we can to, to help get our friends close to God as well. Let's leave with this blessing. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may God's grace, mercy, and peace be with each of us as we leave today, that we will indeed be the light of Christ everywhere we go. So we ask in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. See you during the week.